see everyone uh, and everyone again because I saw some familiar names already. So welcome and welcome back. Uh, this is our first interactive uh, class, basically an interactive seminar on love. And it's given by our uh, lecturer Maria. And she was actually uh, elected as a lecturer of the year 2018 at UCG. So we're really humbled. <laughs> we're really humbled uh, for her to be here. And um, yeah, again, uh, me and Marike, my name is Iris and Marike is my colleague. We're here to monitor everything. So if you have questions whatsoever, you can always post them in the chat box. And um, I'm going to give the floor to Maria. Yeah, so hello everyone. I'm now sharing my video and you can hear my voice. Uh, so it's, it's really a pleasure to be talking to you but i would have wished i could see you in person it cannot happen what to do i hope you're all well uh, and i hope you'll enjoy this interactive seminar um, which i will try to do as interactive as possible now I'll just give you a bit of an introduction to what i'll try to do and um, so um, i with another two colleagues colleagues teach a course an LAS course um, that is meant to be interdisciplinary and we teach um, on love. Yeah? So what I'll share with you today is uh, basically the psychology part of, um, uh, of the course for one of the questions. And so that means I am a scientist actually, and uh, my colleagues, well, one of them is a philosopher and the other one is um, a biologist. So what we try to do basically is that when we identify three questions uh, for which our disciplines have something to say related to that, and then we have three lectures. I teach uh, on love and morality, for example, psychology side. Uh, Adriana, who is the other lecturer, would teach on love and morality biology side. And then Martijn, who is a philosopher, would teach on love and morality philosophy side. And then we have a huge symposium where we try to bring the three disciplines together uh, in an attempt to better understand the relationship of love in relation to a specific topic. Yeah. So uh, today's lecture, uh, as I said before, is on the topic um, love and morality. And now let me try to share my screen. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen right now. Is that the case? Okay, is it better? I, I can see the chat box, by the way, so someone would have to say yes or no. Yes, it's better. Okay, good. All right, so the topic today is on love and morality. And the specific question is whether love can make us behave in immoral ways, yeah? Does love trump morality? Is, uh, is love an obstacle to morality? So that's the actual question. So to begin with, I would like to do something uh, a little bit experimental with you and I hope it works out. So first of all, uh, the not so experimental piece that should be easy. So I would like you to bring a person that you really love uh, a lot to your mind. And once you have done that, then I would like you to uh, go to this website. So it's menti.com. So you'll need to open a new tab or whatever in your phones or computer. Type in menti.com. And then you need to plug in the code you see on your screens. So that's 918723. And you'll see two questions there. And, and what I'm asking is for your yes or no answer to these two questions. Is that clear? Uh, 
All right. Okay, then you go ahead and do it. And um, and as you're responding, uh, I will um, basically open up the page and then we'll be able to see your responses. Yeah, but for now you respond and then I'll share the page in a bit. I think you're extremely good at doing that. Uh, yeah, I don't know why you don't hear. I think that I hear me, so I don't know if it's your microphones. Can you check that? Okay, so uh, these are your answers. So uh, I think most of you have done it by now uh, and your answers are the following. Can you see them by the way? I can't see the chat, so maybe someone will have to tell me yes or no. We can see it. Okay, great. So uh, the first question is, uh, would you tell a lie to protect uh, this person, the person that you really love? for having done a petty crime, so a small crime, like entering a concert without a ticket. And most of you said yes. Um, and then the next question is, uh, well, would you lie to pro... You didn't answer the other question. Can you answer the other question too? It's exciting to see the bars moving, actually. Okay, so, <laughs> so whereas the, the previous question, it was clearly yes. So for a petty crime, you would protect the person you really, really love. But for something more severe, like blackmailing someone, you're a bit torn, huh? So you would or you would not tell a lie. Some of you would, some of you said they would not. If we had time and if we uh, were in person, I would have asked you to explain your answer. But since we don't have so much time now, what I'll do is that I'll go back to my slides. And I'll share some results from studies with you, studies that have used very similar questions. Okay, uh, so I go back and I'll share. Um, I'll share my slides. <coughs> so. As I said, um, the, 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 there is one study that asked very, very similar questions to the one I asked you to do. So this is a study you see over here, published in one of, uh, you know, very popular uh, and reputable psychology journal. So what they did is that they asked people, first of all, to list um, names. So two names of people they are really close with, people they really, really love. So this is the circle over here. And then they ask them to list also two names of very distant relationships of them. So people who they know, but they are at an acquaintance level. So then they ask them uh, whether they would punish or whether they protect people they know very, very well or people they are merely acquainted with for a list of crimes. You see the crimes over here. Now, some of these crimes were petty crimes, like, black, like, for example, illegally entering an event without a ticket, the question I asked you. And some of the crimes would be really serious, like, for example, would you blackmail a person for money? Okay, which is the other question I asked you. 
So there were four conditions, let's say. So would you protect someone you know very well, uh, someone you love a lot, if they would do a petty crime versus a severe crime? Or would you protect a, you know, an acquaintance for having done the same things? And these are the results. Let me talk, like, take you through this graph. So these, the, the, the blue and the red are all the responses. And uh, now blue is for distant acquaintances, so people you don't really know very well. And red is for people that are really close to you. Okay, so and over here in the y-axis, you have the likelihood of protecting the perpetrator. That means you being willing to tell a lie to protect this person from punishment. Okay, and what you see over here is that we are quite, we are very likely to basically save someone we um, we're very close to. Um, if they have done a low severity crime, which is exactly what you said. Huh? But we do so also for people who are a little bit uh, more distant to us, so people who, who are acquaintances. So even though there is a significant difference between the two, what this position of these two shows is that we are likely to tell a white light to protect a person, either we know them very well or not, for having done a crime that is petty crime, okay? And the interesting part, though, is what happens with higher tech crimes, you know, like real stuff. So over here, um, we see that for really, for people who are really close to us, we are still very likely to save them, to protect them from being punished. But for people who are very distant from us, we are very, very willing to punish them, so to not protect them, okay? So the actual difference between people we, you know, really like, we're really close to, and people who are distant from us is shown over here. In other words, we are very likely to, so our love for someone is very likely, uh, uh, so, so, so it's making us act in ways that are biased, so we save them, we don't save others, but also one could say immoral, because we are lying to protect someone for having done a bad thing. <coughs> now, um, me as a scientist would say that, uh, well, this is absolutely normal, because what happens with people we, with, with whom we are really close is that we, it's very easy for us to justify their behavior, even if it's really bad behavior. Why? Because we know the circumstances acting upon them a bit better. So we're very, um, so it's very easy for us to say, well, they've done it because, you know, something horrible happened in their life, or they've done it because, I don't know, they were really not in a good place or whatever. But for people we don't love very much, or people who are distant uh, from us, we don't know their circumstances very well, and in fact, we don't want to know them. So it's much easier for us to say, well, they've done it because they're bad people, and they deserve to be punished. Yeah? A biologist would say, well, that's absolutely normal too, because I mean, we need to survive, and if you don't protect the people who are close to you, who is going to protect you? Yeah. So even though this is actually um, a very human uh, thing to do, uh, someone could say, well, it is biased, and in some ways it is immoral too. So does love uh, make us do immoral thing? As psychologists would say, well, it leads us to do biased things, which sometimes may be also immoral. Now, I want to turn into a different kind of love. Oh, I think we have a question. So someone would have to read it out loud for me because I don't have the chat in front of me. All right. So yeah. Anamarika asks, uh, what is the influence of our unconscious need to protect ourselves by lying about the crime of someone we love? Um, for example, lying for your mom because your life would change when she is in prison. Should it 
yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so the, this is another justification, yeah? So I think it's a perfect justification, and I think it, it aligns very much to, with, uh, um, so with a biologist or an evolutionary psychologist account, which is, well, we need to, in order for us, for the human species, for us as humans to survive, we need to keep those we love close to us because those are the ones to protect us. So what you're saying, I think, is very much in line with that account. And, and it is very much unconscious, I would agree with you. All those evolutionary mechanisms are, are unconscious. They are very deep, but they act unconsciously. Great, thank you. Yeah, so, um, so please share your questions whenever you want. And also what you, what you can also do is to sort of raise up your hand and ask your question using your mic because it's going to be wonderful to hear some voices. It really ought to be talking to a computer, basically. OK, so let us move on to a different uh, type of love. So that's uh, love for a country or for country men, country women, or your compatriots, in other words. So let me first take you through some experiments. <coughs> and then I would like to ask you for, uh, you know, for your own opinion and also potential behavior when you, if you were up against the same sort of dilemmas that I'm going to present right now. So uh, first of all, let me uh, let me show you the main tool we are going to be using. Uh, so this is the trolley problem. Maybe some of you actually already know it. So um, this is a thought experiment. Um, uh, and it's, um, it's a morality problem, right? Uh, and it was created by a philosopher, Philippa Foot, but it's used in, in, in so many disciplines right now to test people's intuitions on certain things. So in this case, uh, so this is the original trolley problem. What you have is that you have a train over here that if it continues going straight, so its own course, it will kill five people, all right? Now, you are this person over here, and you have the power to push this lever. And if you do do that, then the you will divert the train, and it, it will go over here to kill one person. So what you will be doing by pulling the lever is that you will save five people, but sacrifice the life of a person. OK, if you don't pull it, you will allow five people to die. Um, and OK, say, say, say if this is someone who was not in danger to begin with. OK, I'm not going to ask you about your answer. And this is, as I said, only a tool. So what some psychologists did, did in this study that I will show, you, show now is that they added a twist to the trolley problem. So basically, they did this study with Dutch participants. They all happen to be male for this experiment. OK, so this is the Dutch participant over here. So they told them, OK, so this is a trolley problem. You can allow the trolley to kill these five people, but you also have the power to pull the lever to save this someone. Now, this someone in half of the cases happened to be an Arab person. Okay, so the option they had was to either allow these five people whose nationality was not known to them die, or uh, pull the lever, kill an Arab, and save the lives of these people. Okay, so that's for half of the participants. For the other half of the participants, um, they, it, it was exactly the same, but this time around they would kill another Dutch person. So for half of the participants over here, if you pull the lever, you kill Mohammed to say five, five. If in this condition over here, you can save five or kill Martin uh, to save five. OK? And they ask them, OK, what would you do? Would you kill Mohammed? Would you kill Martin to save five? And this is what they answered. 
So, um, these, so five over here means yes, I will sacrifice the target for sure. So the target being either Mohammed or Martin. Okay. So five is I will certainly sacrifice the target to say five and zero is no chance. I would never do that. So as you see, there is a bit of a greater chance to kill Mohammed instead of Martin to say five. But this difference over here um, is called non-statistically significant. So if you were to test this difference with a, a wide amount of people, you wouldn't find a significant difference in their behavior. So no preference to save Martin um, or a preference to save uh, Mohammed. Okay. So, so far, so good. In the uh, second part of their experiment, what they did is that they kept the in-group, so the Dutch uh, killing Dutch or Dutch killing Arab uh, conditions, but to half of the participants, they gave oxytocin, so this is this drug over there, and to the other half of the participants, they only gave a pill that did nothing. Now, for you to know what the experiment is doing, you need to also know what oxytocin um, is doing. So I suppose some of you already know, but for those of you who do not know, oxytocin is a neurotransmitter and it's also a hormone. <clears throat> it was actually really dubbed as the love hormone. Yeah. Why? Because uh, it can be found in abundance uh, in uh, mothers when they deliver a child. It's actually uh, the hormone that is keeping them there, attached to the child, helping them to be such good carers. Uh, but it's also there when you fall in love, okay? Um, and what, what oxytocin does is that it makes us stick closer to people who we consider as in-group members. In-group members are those people we, are, we consider to be our own people, okay? In this case, it would be countrymen. In other cases, it would be our family or anyone we consider to be our own people. Okay? All right. So in ha for half of the participants, they gave this love hormone that would increase their love towards their own species, their own race, their own ethnic group, their own nationality. Okay? And to the other half of the participants, they gave pretty much nothing. We would call that a placebo. Okay. So what happens here? Now, this is the placebo condition. Okay. And in the placebo condition, the placebo condition is the one I already showed you, where there is no preference for saving Martin or Ahmed. So over here, though, that's the oxytocin condition. This is where we induced love, okay? So what happens is that these guys over here are way more likely to kill Ahmed, in sorry, Mohammed. In fact, they are very, very likely to kill Mohammed. And their, you know, their propensity to kill Martin actually drops, okay? So in this condition over here, they are way less likely to sacrifice their own, you know, their in-group, and way more likely to sacrifice people they would consider to be out-group, so people who are not in-group members, people who are not us, okay? Okay, and the same happens with Germans too, so it's not a personal vendetta against Arabs, but the same happens with Germans. So in the placebo condition, there is no preference to kill or to save um, uh, the in-group or the out-group member. But in the oxytocin condition, the, 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 the propensity to kill a German, to sacrifice a German increases, whereas the pro propensity to kill an in-group member decreases. Okay? So... This is what oxytocin, the love hormone, does to us. It makes us favor our in-group members and actually be more willing to derogate against or behave in unfavorable ways against out-group members. 
Now, is this immoral? I would once again say it's a very strong bias that can lead us to bad places. Yeah? Final thing. Um, so, so in the trolley dilemmas uh, I showed you so far, you could pull the lever and you know either save five or kill. Uh, so I either kill five or save them by killing uh, an in-group member or an out-group member. There was a there was a question, I think. Yes. yes. Um, Seda, I'm sorry if I if I have it wrong. Um, do you think it is correct to consider this test results to show reality because it will be a very different experience in real life? Um, is it possible to predict the decision before if it happened in real life? Wouldn't panic take control? So if it happened, what was the last one? If it happened in real life? So um, if it happened in real life, wouldn't panic take control? You mean, you mean the, the trolley dilemma? Yes, yes. I think it's about, yeah, yeah. It's about the trolley dilemma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the uh, these thought experiments, these moral dilemmas, they are far removed from real life, and, and I, I would give you that. And um, so, what, what they are checking are only the intuitions of people, their um, tendencies to behave in a certain way. But in real life, I think there are so many other variables, you know, so many other things happening that could influence your behavior. Um, that, uh, that, that makes it really hard to be able to say that these results would certainly happen, you know, that would certainly be found in real life. But it is testing the intuitions of people. And I think what these studies are showing us is when we chemically, you know, intervene and we make people feel in love with their countries, so their intuitions change. And uh, what their new intuitions are is that, well, and it's very unconscious, huh? So it's, well, I'll, I'll save my own now. Um, but let's discuss this a bit more because I have a group exercise for you that is touching upon the, this, the, this concept of love for a country. And um, yeah, I don't know if, if it will be answering your question or responding to it, to it in any way, but um, I would like you to think a bit more about this concept of love for a country. Was there another question? No, it's just thank you so much for answering the previous question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Um, no worries. So, um, so the final um, uh, set of experiments I wanted to present to you um, have another slight twist. So the question they actually ask is, would you sacrifice yourself to save your in-group? So you're not pulling a lever anymore, but you're actually putting yourself in front of the train. So once again, a scenario that is, you know, rather unlikely to happen in real life. Um, but once again, it's merely there to test intuitions, okay? So the question is, would you sacrifice yourself to save your in-group? And how, this is how they check that. So it was, once again, a trolley dilemma. And as it goes, so the trolley or the train will hit these five Spanish women. This, uh, this uh, study was conducted in Spain. So it would kill five Spanish people and unless you jump in front of it and then you save the life of these five Spanish people. Okay, so the question becomes, would you sacrifice yourself to save your in-group. Two options, you either let them die or you throw yourself in front of the train in a very traumatic way to save them, okay? So they ask these kind of questions to um, a bunch of Spanish undergraduate students, both women and men. But before they asked them, they told them, okay, before you answer a set of uh, questions, we want you to tell us how you feel in relation to Spain, okay? So, and to answer this question, they gave them 
um, these graphs over here, these schemas, okay? So this big circle represented the group, so Spain, and the smaller circle represented their own selves, okay? And they told them, okay, which of the five uh, graphs best represents how you feel about Spain, okay? So in this case over here, so it would be like, okay, Spain is my country, but you know, I'm not at all attached to it. So here there is some attachment, here is even more, and over here it's complete fusion with Spain. It's like Spain is, is so the fact that I'm Spanish is extremely important to me. Okay, I could say that these um, shapes over here represent love for a country. So here there is maximum love, and over here, well, there is no hate, but there is indifference. Okay, so then they grouped their participants. So if they selected these two options over here, they would cluster them under the group no fusion with Spain or very little love for Spain. And those people who, who, who answered um, using these two possible graphs, they would classify them as um, the group that is really fused with Spain, okay? They really love their country. Okay, so they, as I said, they asked this question that I showed you before. So would you kill yourself to save five Spanish, okay? So the people who said they are not fused with Spain, so though Spain doesn't mean too much for them, they would, so 76% of them said, well, you know, I care about them, but I didn't let them die. And 24% said, okay, I would sacrifice myself to save group members, okay? So three in four said, I'll let them die. Those people that were fused with Spain responded using the exact opposite responses, okay? So three in four said, of course, I would die to kill five in-group members. And one of them, one of the four would say, yeah, maybe, maybe we would let them die, okay? That's quite interesting. And in the second, uh, in a second experiment, so still with Spanish undergraduate students, uh, females and males, they said, okay, you have three options over here. So the trolley, if it goes on, it would kill five Europeans. If you divert it, it would, um, it would uh, kill a Spanish woman, okay? Uh, or you could throw your, you could divert it to kill yourself, okay? So you can use the lever, but you can either use it to kill one Spanish person or use the lever the other way around to kill you, okay? Now, what is interesting for you to know, I think, is that uh, people who say they are fused with Spain and with Spain being a member of the European Union, they also have rather positive feelings towards the European Union. So the European Union, Europeans, would be an extended in-group for them. Okay, so the results for this were, so people who are not fused with Spain, 63% of them said, I'll let the Europeans die, okay? 14% said, um, I'd kill another Spanish person to save five Europeans. And 23, 24% said, okay, I would sacrifice myself. But the majority would just let the five Europeans die. For people who are fused with Spain, 63% said, I will sacrifice myself to save five Europeans. I would certainly not sacrifice an in-group member. And some of them said, okay, I would let them die. But the vast majority over here, okay, so once again, we have the reverse results. So the vast majority would say, I would sacrifice myself to save five Europeans. Once again, we don't know if this would happen in real life. These are just intuitions. But there are clear differences between the two groups. Um, and final experiment. So over here, so you have two trolleys coming. And 
if you allow them to just continue straight, they will, they will kill five Europeans and five Americans. So 10 people will die. And you have the option to either save five Europeans by killing yourself, by throwing yourself in front of the train, or save five Americans um, by killing yourself and allow five Europeans to die. Okay, so these were the options. Now, people who are fused with Spain, um, nobody would kill themselves to save five Europeans or five Americans. Sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry, ignore it. So 90% said uh, I wouldn't kill myself to um, to save five Europeans or five Americans. In other words, I would let them die, okay? And so 9.8% said, okay, if I threw myself, I would throw it for Europeans. But zero participants said, I would sacrifice myself for Americans, okay? Now, what happens with uh, the groups that is fused with Spain? 88% said, yes, I would sacrifice my group to save five Europeans, okay? 12% said, no, I would let all of them die. But once again, 0% said, I would save Americans. So obviously, Americans is not, you know, the most um, favorite groups of Spaniards. Either they love their country or not. But the idea is that Americans here is, are really constructed as an outgroup. So nobody said they would save them, okay? Is that biased? Is this immoral? I don't know. So as I, would, as I said before, I think love for a country will lead us to biased behavior. So more likely to protect our own people, even if this means killing ourselves for them. But it also means that we are willing to let some people, like the Americans over here, die. So it's preferential treatment. Is this immoral? I would say it's really biased, but it can take us to bad places. Now, thinking about your own countrymen or country women, uh, whichever your country is, can you go to menti.com and this time insert code 196148 and answer the two questions that are over there. Maybe three, actually, three questions. And I'll start sharing my link with you to see your answers soon. We can only answer one question at a time. OK, let me fix that. Maria, what's the code again? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, it's uh, 196148. Okay, so once once you have finished answering the first question, I, I'll uh, I'll press next to answer the next one. But for now, only seven people answered the first question. So, can I have some more answers.
Okay, it's not getting much better. So to the question, would you sacrifice yourself to save five countrymen or women in the trolley dilemma? Five of you said no and three of you said yes. Can we have some more answers before I push it to go to, to, to the next question? So one more second and then we move to the next question. So, so far, uh, 13 of you said, no, I wouldn't jump in front of the train to save country women, save uh, country men or country women. Uh, 14 to seven, actually. Okay, that's quite interesting. That's very unlike Spain. Uh, so I push it now to go to the next question. So the next question is on a scale from 0 to 100, how much would you say you love your home country, whichever your home country is? So zero is not at all. And 100, um, is, it means everything to me. All right. It's amazing. We have a huge variation of responses. Okay. So, so if I were to predict your answers to the previous questions, question, so the yes or no, would you jump in front of the train to save five country men? then I would expect those, these people over here to be the ones who have answered yes. And I wonder if this is the case. I cannot really check it now with you. Uh, but that would be my hypothesis based on the experiments I just shared with you. Okay, and the final question is, have your levels of love towards your country changed after the corona outbreak? And 12 of you said yes, and 14 of you said no, which is, well, it's 14, 14 right now, which is very, very interesting. So 15 to 14. All right, I'll stop sharing with you now because I want to move to the very final thing I want to do with you today. So um, Uh, so give me a second to go back to my, uh -huh. okay, so um, I, I saw a comment coming in and I'll try to uh, respond to it later on. But for now, what I would like you to do is to, so Marike will break you into groups in a moment. But what I would like you to do in your groups is to discuss the following. So patriotism and nationalism are both considered to be instances of love for a country. Okay. My question to you is, are they different from each other? And if so, how? You have 10 to 15 minutes to answer this question. And to answer it as a group, um, you basically, so I'm expecting like a, like a, a hundred word answer or so. So uh, you go once again to menti.com, insert the code you see on your screens, uh, and then um, give your 
group answer. So you're answering to the question, are patriotism and nationalism, which are both considered to be love for a country, different? And if they are different, in which ways do they differ? Okay, so I'll, um, I'll perhaps type in into the, the chat box so that you don't lose it. Uh, but Marike will now distribute you randomly into different rooms where you'll get to, first of all, meet each other, and second of all, discuss this question. Are there any questions before we move on? Uh, Marike or Iris, can you read the questions out loud? All right. So Anna Mike is asking, could you specify exactly what do they have to do? So um, yeah, please, please answer the question. So, what, so what, what is the question? Sorry. What is the question they have to discuss? I think you mean the one uh, that is on the shared screen. So that is. Yeah. Uh, so the, the question is, uh, so patriotism and nationalism are both considered to be instances of love for a country. Okay, so both patriots and nationalists really, really love their country. But is patriotism and nationalism, are they different from each other? And if you think they are different, how are they different from each other? And if that is clear, then we switch to groups. Yeah, so shall I? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Let's, um, so you have five minutes to do that, sorry. It's just that we are running out of time.
Okay, I think we have one more group to go and we are done. Or are we done already? There are two answers that are similar, so I don't know if they're from the same group or not. Um, so, Mariquette, uh, at 3 p.m. we can all come back because I think we are pretty much uh, complete.
All right, we'll bring you all into the main room now. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. All right, so um, welcome back. I've been reading your answers while you were posting them. And uh, I have a couple of comments, basically, and these are really concluding remarks. So first of all, I think you've done very well. I, I think you identified some key difference between the two constructs. And so indeed, patriotism is a love for a country that is self-referential. So you love for a country merely because it happens to be your country. Whereas um, in nationalism, love for a country is sort of fueled by, um, by a downward comparison with other countries. So you don't only love, for a country, love your country for what it is, but you also love it because you think it's the best as well. So there is a component of, um, of outgroup hate in nationalism. There is one very interesting answer over here. Uh, some of you said, I think that both words have the same meaning, but that nationalism is more about the, a group of people, uh, whereas patriotism is about the country that you're living in. And you would be also right, actually. That's a different definition of nationalism. But if we agree that patriotism and nationalism, um, uh, uh, as, so if we both see them as love for a country and not a different group, then the difference is the one I told you just before. Now, one of you said that it's about intensity. Yeah. So in nationalism, you love your, you simply love your country more. You're fused with it. Yeah. Whereas uh, someone else said, well, it's about the, the how healthy um, the kind of love you nurture is. So uh, I want to just close by saying that this is a question that is, first of all, difficult. Um, but it's also a question that we are addressing in a book chapter with my colleagues. So with the two teachers I teach the, the love course um, with. So our argument is that um, patriotism and nationalism are different in the ways I explained before, but also because they implicate different types of love. So uh, patriotism resembles more maternal love or familial love, the love we feel towards family members, whereas nationalism resembles more passionate, romantic love, which is way more intense, you could say, but also way more blind and reckless, and it can drive us to bad places, let's say. So I guess this would be uh, uh, the last thing I wanted to share with you. Um, I don't know if there are any more questions on anything I've said uh, today uh, or questions about the program uh, that perhaps Marike and Iris would be better than me to answer. But any kind of questions you have, please go ahead and share them either now or at a later stage with Marike and Iris. But if there are questions about this lecture, please share them with me now. Yeah, go ahead, Deepak. Yeah, go ahead. You can speak if you want. Uh, unfortunately, we can't hear you very well, so you might have to type it in after all. Uh, Maria, unfortunately, yeah. uh, participants can't speak. Oh, they can't. Okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, so Deepak, can you please type in your question? And the same goes for anyone else who wants to ask questions. And if there are no questions, no worries, of course. Yeah, that, so that's an interesting question. And I, I, I think the distinction you're making is between us being uh, um, like driven by biology or uh, psychology more. Um, well, I'm a psychologist, so <laughs> you know what my answer would be. Actually, the, the question, uh, one of the questions I asked is, uh, has your love for your country 
changed after the corona outbreak. And uh, what I was getting at is that um, our love for a country is not fixed, um, uh, but it is very much shaped by circumstances. And many of you said actually that your love for a country has changed after the recent incidences. So I think that um, circumstances shape us, context shape us, and if culture is context, then it certainly shapes us. So in many ways, we are cultural beings. Yeah, so Marianne is saying, I mean, I would say if anyone regardless of culture or ethnicity or country, so how does that relate to the in-group and out-group theory? Well, um, I mean, that's amazing that you say that, Marianne. Um, and, uh, you know, when we teach the love course, one of the types of love we we share uh, with students or we teach students about is um, something called agape, which is a Greek uh, word. And it really, leave, it really means unconditional love, love for the humankind and beyond, perhaps. So, and the idea is that um, uh, in agape, in the same way you don't have any conditions, you have no restrictions either, you know? So what you're expressing, it's, um, it's a behavior that is very agapetic, yeah? And whether it is always easy to do that, um, well, I, I will leave it to you to determine, right? Um, but um, yeah, I, I guess it will take a lot of a, a bit of observation of your own behavior to to see whether this tendency that you just described is changing depending on circumstances or the context. So Deepak is asking, so are we supposed to develop universal love uh, more in line with feminine love uh, than, in, than intense romantic love? I mean, is it possible to develop universal, ah, sorry, to, to develop universal culture? So by that, I mean, is it possible to develop agape, to practice agape? Um, I would answer with a big I don't know to that. I would hope so, but this may sound a little bit hippish. Is it, um, it we can always aspire to it and to it and strive for it. Um, but as I said before, there are certain circumstances, certain contexts in which um, our love for our country will resemble intense romantic love and we will favor it um, uh, just because the circumstances um, ask for it, I would say. Yeah, I think Alicia, what he means by feminine love is probably motherly love. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Well, I don't um, see any other questions coming in. Deepak, I don't know Julia Kristeva, so I'll, uh, I'm making a note here to check it up. It seems to me that this is a, a term she's using. Yeah, okay, thanks. I'll check it out. All right. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Maria, for this interesting lecture on love. Uh, I certainly learned um, a lot more. And I hope you all did. I really hope you all thought it was really interesting. I really like the way of uh, breaking you up into groups. And I hope you also got to share uh, different perspectives and different ideas on topics we discussed today. For now, I really want to thank you, Maria, for being here and, and, and joining us in this session. and teaching us a little bit more uh, while we are in the comfort of our own home so thank you <laughs> um no worries i i, I just wanted to say uh, take care
uh, stay safe and take care of yourselves and of each other. I really do hope I see at least some of you in September. Perfect. Yeah, I do too. Well, um, and thank you all and take care and maybe see you again next time. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye. Bye.